All right, so our topic for this first lecture is the, the roots of American government. And easier if you guys lights on or lights off? Oh. Lights off? Okay. Talking about the roots of American government, we're going to look, I mean, think about a tree, right? I mean, you know, you see the tree, but underneath of it are all those supporting roots that, that help feed it. So, important thing for us to realize is that, if I can get this to work, our founding fathers did not invent all of the great ideas that became our government, right? What we did is we borrowed things that we liked from other areas. So in the lecture today, we're going to discuss four different roots that sort of feed into our system of government here in America. The first area we're going to talk about is religious roots. Talk about religious roots. Our founding fathers, just about all, came from what was called a Judeo-Christian background. Right? These were religious men. And because of their religious background, they shared a belief that society should be based on justice and respect for the law. I'll say that again. Our founding fathers, because they, they had this religious background, they shared these religious beliefs. They had a belief that, that a government and society should be based on justice and respect for the law. Our founding fathers' religious background also taught them that there is such a thing as natural laws. Natural laws. And what that term means, natural laws, is the idea that there exists a universal set of morals that apply to any country and any culture. Natural laws is the idea that there is a universal set of morals or principles that apply to any country or any culture. Some people view these natural laws as God-made laws, right? That these are, these are the laws that apply everywhere, and they are bigger than man-made laws. that apply simply by being human. Can anyone think of an example of a natural law that might apply to everyone regardless of where on earth you live? What do you have a right to simply by being human? You have the right to live. You have the right 
to life. Right? Think of any others. To be free. Okay. Freedom. Right? Our founding fathers believed that, that freedom was an essential human right. It was a natural law. Okay? That's a good example as well. So for each one of our roots, what I want to share with you guys is how do we see that in our government today? Okay, so I'm going to finish, right, when I talk about these different, some of the different roots, I'll, I'll tie in how do we see that in our government today. Well, we see the idea of natural laws right in our Declaration of Independence. In our founding document, Thomas Jefferson wrote in some very important natural laws that we as a country believe everyone is entitled to. And he phrased, he phrased them as three things. What are they? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are examples of natural laws. So our founding fathers believed this. Natural laws exist. Everybody has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And where do those beliefs come from? They, they come from that religious background of our founding fathers. The next route that I want to address comes from ancient times, classical, classical roots. So when we're talking about classical, we're referring back, way, way back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. The first classical root we took from ancient Greece. And that was the idea of direct democracy. So Greece gives us the idea of direct democracy, which means that individual citizens help make important decisions. So in ancient Greece, right, does anyone know how, how ancient Greece was set up? It was basically a bunch of Sparta, Athens, for example. Those are different starts with a C. Cities. cities, right? They're little city states. Okay? And Anyone who was eligible in Athens could come and have their voice heard on making important decisions. That's the idea of direct democracy. People can participate in helping to make the decisions. So democracy is born in Greece. And in fact, the root of the word democracy is demos, which is people. Right? That is Greek for people. The people are the rulers. Now that's all well and good. If you're a small city-state like Athens, everybody could come and participate. 
Can you imagine what it would be like in America if every single eligible person could go to Washington and have a say and vote on every single law? We need a bigger Washington. Maybe. We would need a much larger Washington. And, and, would, and there would, okay. would be like... So, so our options are we have a bigger Washington, okay? Like or we, we change the system, okay? And so, again, we didn't have to invent this stuff. Somebody else already invented it. And in this case, it was the Romans. So from Rome, we borrow the idea of representative democracy. Rome was a heck of a lot bigger than Greece. You couldn't have everybody in the Roman Empire have a say. So they come up with this idea of representative democracy, which is where the people elect representatives to make decisions for them. Say that again. Representative democracy is where the people elect representatives to make the decisions for them. That works a lot better for a large country. Right? We have over 300 million people in the United States. We can't have 300 million people voting on every single thing. So we as a country get together and we elect 435 plus 100 senators to go to Washington and make those decisions for us. Now, also from Rome, we borrow another idea that we build into our government, into American democracy, and that's the idea of civic virtue. That is the idea of civic virtue. And civic virtue is the idea that people should be willing to serve their country when called upon. So three important ideas. Direct democracy, representative democracy, Civic virtue that, that all come out of this classical period, ancient Greece and Rome. So how do we see them in our government today? Well, we see democracy in our government today because we vote for people to represent us at the local level, the state level, and the national level. So still today, we have that belief in representative democracy. We vote for people to make the decisions for us. And we see civic virtue in action today through the pictures here. Right? Serving in the military. That's a display of civic virtue. Serving on a jury, we would say, is a civic virtue. Voting, I think many would say, demonstrates civic virtue. Okay, so we've covered two roots so far, religious roots and classical roots. Let's move on to 
our third set of roots. English roots. We know that, because you guys are smart, we came out of England, right? We were an English colony, we were ruled over by England, and we eventually overthrew the English. So obviously there are some things about the way the British or the English ran our governments that we didn't like. But there were still some things that we did like. And we liked them so much we kept them. The first thing that we kept came out of a document called the Magna Carta. Which I don't really care that you know the date, but in case you're wondering, the Magna Carta was 1215. And what the Magna Carta establishes, the important idea that it establishes, is what is called the rule of law. Long story short, and you don't have to really have to get this part down, the background of the Magna Carta, but effectively, the English king was pretty much doing whatever he wanted, exercising pretty much unlimited power, and the nobles in the country got fed up with it. And they kind of kidnapped the king and sat him down and said, all right, king, here's the deal. We wrote up this document called the Magna Carta, and it puts some limits on your power. Now sign it. Now when you've been kidnapped, right, you know, he signed it. And it's been an important part of the English government and, and later on in our government ever since because it establishes the rule of law. What the rule of law does is it establishes the fact that no one is above the law, not even a king. No one is above the law, not even a king. Didn't Napoleon say that he was above the law? What happened to Napoleon? Mm. Something to this rule of law. Right? Funny thing, right? People start demanding that. They start expecting that, that everybody has to follow the rules. Right? No one's above the law. Not even a king. So how do we see that in our government today? How do we see the rule of law in our government today? What is, what's the modern translation? How does that apply to our government today? Okay, it's, it's built into the Constitution, but, but what does it look like? What does that mean? Who does this mean is not above the law in our country? Everyone. The president, senators, Supreme Court judges, right? It doesn't matter how powerful you are in our country today. Everyone is still subject to the same laws. Later on in this semester, we're going to learn about a president who kind of forgot about this and got himself into some trouble. He became the only president in our history to resign. He resigned because he thought he was above the law, and he's not. All right, so that's what we take away from the Magna Carta, the important principle, the rule of law. The next important English document that we steal something that we liked is called the Petition of Right. The English Petition of Right. And the important idea that we steal from that is limited government. Simply put, the idea of limited government is exactly that. 
right? The, the idea is that the, the power of the government is not absolute. The power of the government is not absolute. The government cannot do anything it feels like doing. There are limits to the government's power. And we see that in our government today through what's called our system of checks and balances. Limited government lives on in our government today through checks and balances, which basically just establishes ways for each branch of government to keep the other branches from becoming too powerful. It gives us ways to limit the government. Okay, our third idea that we steal from England comes from a document called the English Bill of Rights. And I couldn't find a good picture of it, so here's a clip art. The English Bill of Rights, 1689, and the important principle we take from the English Bill of Rights is individual rights. The idea of individual rights means that every citizen has rights which cannot be arbitrarily taken away by the government. Arbitrarily. What does that word mean, arbitrarily, if something is arbitrary? Randomly or yeah. Their own will. yeah, randomly or just whenever you please, right? There's no rhyme or reason to it. That's what that word means. So individual rights. Everybody has rights that cannot arbitrarily, randomly be taken away by the government. Doesn't mean they can't be taken away. They just can't be taken away without a good reason. We see the idea of individual rights in our government today through our own Bill of Rights at the national level and through Bills of Rights at the state level. Just about every single state, probably everyone, I don't know that for sure, but just about every state has a Bill of Rights, and we also have a National Bill of Rights. It lays out the rights that you enjoy as a citizen. What are some examples of rights that you share because of our Bill of Rights? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. What else? Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. What else? Freedom Press. of the press. Freedom of the press. What does the Second Amendment give you a right to do? Bear arms. Bear arms. I have and roll up those sleeves bears. all you want. Okay. Now that's a good example of what I mean by your rights cannot arbitrarily be taken away. The Second Amendment gives you, the, the, and you don't have to write this down, but we'll get to those. The Second Amendment gives you the right to bear arms. Does that mean you can do whatever you want with a gun? No. No. Right? That right can be taken away. Right? The government can reasonably restrict that right. We don't want dangerous criminals with guns. There are, though. There are, right? 
but they don't have that right, and they can be arrested for it. Right? But the government cannot just willy-nilly be like, oh, well, we're just going to randomly pick people, and you're not allowed to have a gun, but you can, and you're not, but you can. Right? So the, the rights can be restricted, but, but just not in an arbitrary or random manner. Okay. So that covers three important ideas we take away from England. Our last, our fourth area or root of American democracy comes out of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is the name given to, I, I always kind of picture it as a period where people just sit around thinking of ideas. Okay? <laughs> Lots of really great ideas about government and politics, and economy, and sociology, and religion, and the arts come out of this period, and it collectively gets called the Enlightenment. There's a lot going on, lots of scientific discoveries. But for our purposes, we're going to focus on four different people. Two of them came out of England, a guy by the name of Thomas Hobbes, and a guy by the name of John Locke. So let's start with Hobbes, because he came first. Thomas Hobbes establishes the idea of the social contract. And the social contract for Thomas Hobbes was this. The people enter into an agreement with the ruler, right? Because that's what a contract is. It's an agreement. So the people enter into an agreement with the ruler. The people give up power to the ruler. They say, we have the power, we give it to you, the ruler. And in exchange, the ruler has to protect the people. So for Hobbes, the social contract meant... The people give up some freedom to the ruler, they give power to the ruler, and in return, the ruler has to protect them. And Hobbes meant literally protect them. As long as he kept the people safe from physical harm, he was doing his job. He didn't say anything about protecting their rights. He, he literally meant protect them. Keep them safe from invasion and danger. Now John Locke, is going to build on Hobbes' idea. John Locke's going to build on that idea of the social contract. And Locke says that the ruler also has to protect the rights of the people. For John Locke, it's not just about physically protecting the people. The ruler also has to, to protect the rights of the people. And Locke adds an important extra step. Locke says, if the ruler fails to uphold his end of the contract, then the people have the right to do what? Overthrow the ruler. Get rid of the ruler. You can see how that affected <laughs> our country. 
right? I mean, that's exactly what we did in the revolution. We felt there was a ruler who was not protecting our rights, and therefore we had the obligation of overthrowing that ruler. It's built into our Declaration of Independence. Now, the, now you might be asking, you might not, it's okay if you're not, but some of you might be like, well, yeah, I mean, I get that back in the 1700s, but how does that, how does that affect us today, right? I mean, we, we're more civilized now, right? We're not going to have a violent overthrow of our government. And here is what I would say to that. This idea of the social contract is very much alive in our government today. We overthrow our government frequently. How do we do it? We vote. Okay? We get a chance to overthrow our government peacefully through the vote. So that same idea still exists in our government today. The government's got to protect our rights, and if they don't, we can switch them out. We can get rid of them. We can change them. So we still do this today. We just do it more peacefully. If you follow the news at all, you know that there are other areas of the world where it's not done so peacefully. That, that this idea of the social contract still exists in other parts of the world, but it's not done peacefully. It's done through violence and force. So these are important ideas that still, still affect us. Social contract. All right, the last two important thinkers we're going to talk about here are a couple French thinkers. Oui, oui. Oui, oui. Baron de Montesquieu and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I don't know why. Whenever I say French people's names, I just want to be like, huh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Huh. Let's start with Montesquieu. Montesquieu is a French thinker who established the idea of separation of power. Separation of power. That's the big idea with Montesquieu. He said, the best way to make sure the government doesn't get too powerful is to have three different branches that can block each other. The best way to keep the government from getting too powerful is to have three different branches that are able to block each other. And that was a pretty bold idea back then. He lived in a period of absolute monarchy, right, where all of the power was in the king. Right? Remember, monarchy is that government of one. All of the power was vested in the king. And he says, that's not the best system. We need to split that power up into three different groups that are able to block each other and keep each other from becoming too powerful. Rousseau helped to develop the idea of popular sovereignty. And I'm not writing those terms up on the board because they're already in your outline. Popular sovereignty. So if you don't know how to spell them, you can copy and paste them from, from your outline into your notes. So Rousseau, popular sovereignty. And that is the idea that government should be based on the will of the people. Government should be based on the will of people. So 
So how do these show up in our government today? They show up because we have a three-branch system of government. We took Montesquieu's idea. We've set up our government into three branches. And the government is based on what the people want. The people express their will, how? By voting. Right, so even right here early on, beginning of the school year, right, we're, we're starting to get the sense that voting matters. Right, it's how the government knows what the people want. It's how we get rid of leaders who are bad. Voting matters. You know, popular sovereignty. Government's going to do what the people want. If only 25% of people show up and vote, we don't know if, we're, if the government's doing what the people want or not. So it is critical that we vote. How many of you are 18 already? Okay. Most of you. Good. Okay. If you are not registered to vote, you need to register. Okay. You will, coming up very quickly, you will get a chance to vote in primaries. Right? Republican and Democratic primaries are going to be coming up soon. You'll get a chance to vote in those. We're going to have primaries for different positions, state level, local level. Right. You've got to vote. Because government's based on what the people want. Are there questions? Any questions about any of the ideas that we discussed in this lecture? Okay.